I have a question for you this morning. Do you believe God knows everything? Everything? Does he know about the people who have lost their jobs during this coronavirus crisis that we're facing? Does he know about the people who have so much fear in their hearts and their minds today? Does he know how much this pastor wants to have his congregation here gathered together and assembled together each Sunday so we can worship together? Does he really know? Does he care? If he knows, why doesn't he just fix it? Couldn't he just stop the virus or provide someone the wisdom to deal with it or create a vaccine? Couldn't he arrange it so that anyone who's a Christian would have some kind of immunity to this thing? As you know, I'm sure, these kinds of questions have been asked for hundreds of years. How do we know that God knows and that he cares? Those of us who believe the Bible believe that it has the answers to life's most perplexing questions. The Bible is a fascinating book. Very often in the Bible, God gives us a story of a situation in the life of a man or woman or a family to illustrate to us that he knows and that he cares. The God who took care of someone years ago in a certain situation is the same God that can take care of the situations we face today. Most of us like to hear good stories with happy endings, and this morning, I want us to study one of those happy ending stories. Look with me, if you're able, to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, as we get to the story in 1 Kings chapter 17, we're learning about a very evil king, King Ahab. In fact, in the previous chapter, we're told about his wickedness. While you're finding 1 Kings chapter 17, let me read a little bit of what we learn about King Ahab in chapter 16. In verse 29, we're told this, and in the 38th and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 20 and two years. Now listen, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. At this time in Israel, he is called out as the most wicked king they'd ever had. The scripture goes on to tell some of the things he did in rejecting God and worshiping false idols. And then in verse 33 of chapter 16, we read this, And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So we understand as we're reading, and we're going to learn the story of Elijah, one of the stories of his life, that he's dealing with a very wicked King. Now we're beginning our reading in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. If you have a Bible where you can follow, follow along as I read the first seven verses. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, that's the king, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Verse 7 is our text. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Some people have the idea that problems only come in the lives of bad people. Problems shouldn't come in the lives of good people. 
This wicked king, he should have the problems. Our prophet Elijah, he should not have problems. But we're going to see that even a prophet of God who is obedient to God in the will of God can face some problems. First of all, let's meet the prophet. His name's Elijah. We we'll meet him in verse 1. He's called here Elijah the Tishbite. He's mentioned at least 70 times in the Old Testament and at least 30 times in the New Testament. But here, when he's introduced, we have no fancy introduction, no accolades of his accomplishments, simply that he is Elijah the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead. As we learn about this time in his life, we need to understand that this is not a time of rebellion against God. This is not a time of disobedience against God. Sometimes, again, Christians are guilty of judging others. They see some Christian person or even some wicked person who's going through a very hard time in his life, and they look at him and say, boy, he must really be being disobedient to God, or he must have done something wrong. We look at America, and we see these problems here, and we wonder, is this punishment from God? It may be, but we don't always have that answer. The Bible warns us against judging each other. We don't know why God allows certain problems or afflictions at certain times in people's lives. So back in 1 Kings chapter 17, we hear the prophecy that Elijah had for Ahab. Again, verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah had a word of prophecy for King Ahab. In fact, he had an extended weather forecast, if you will. The weather forecast was this. He says, King, there'll be no rain. There'll be not even any dew on the ground until God gives me the word to say it. Prior to we, the king would know exactly what that meant. It meant crops would fail. It meant they would fight, uh, face big problems in their land. It meant there probably would be a, um, a famine in the land. Now, I don't think that's the entire message that Elijah had for him. As we read the rest of this, it looks like Elijah probably mentioned his wickedness, probably mentioned the idol worship he had gotten into. The reason I say this is because as we read continually, continuously, we read verse 2, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, now this is to Elijah. Elijah's given the message to the prophet. Now the word comes to Elijah himself, saying, get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. He says, Elijah, you've delivered the message, now get out of there. Go up there to the north end, this little tributary to the Jordan River, Cherith, this little brook, and you go hide there. God knew that Elijah's life would be in danger. As we continue reading, though, we read about the protection. The king would not respond well to this prophecy, of course. Later on, we find that the queen, his wife, who was actually more wicked than King Ahab, also blamed Elijah for all this and threatened to kill him. So God told Elijah to go and hide by this brook called Cherith. This would be a safe place where God could protect his prophet. Now, as I read these stories, sometimes I let my mind go there and I say, I wonder what the prophet was thinking. Didn't God know that the king would be angry? Didn't God know that this was not the kind of a message to deliver to the king? In fact, this might have been the very first time Elijah uttered a prophecy. Thankfully, though, he was right exactly in God's will. He was obeying God completely while he's doing this. And God, therefore, is going to provide protection for him. In the New Testament, we have this promise found in Hebrews chapter 13. For he, the Lord, hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man should do unto me. I'm thankful that we don't have to be afraid. When we're in God's will, we have his protection. I'm thankful that God is with me. I'm thankful that I can depend on his protection. <laughs> the current wisdom with regards to this virus is that we hide ourselves. 
We shelter in place. We go hide in our homes. We go back and not get around public. I understand that. We're told to wear masks. We're told we can't gather, gather together as a church. You say, wait a minute. In fact, I heard the governor this week say, I haven't closed down churches. However, he's limited the number that can gather to 10. So he, in essence, has closed down churches. But that's why we're doing this. We're hiding from this. In Elijah's case, God said, you hide from the king and I'll protect you where you're hiding. So the prophet obeyed the Lord and we learned about the provision. This is a, this is a cool story. If you don't remember this, let me, have you, have you lived long enough to understand that God can provide our needs? God will provide our needs. He doesn't always provide our wants or our greeds perhaps, but he provides our needs. So listen to the explanation here in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Well, now probably in this time period, drinking from a brook would not be too unusual. Today, instead of drinking from a brook, we go to the store and buy water that somebody else probably collected from a book, brook, and we put, and put it in a bottle, and we pay for it. Elijah got his for free. Not only that, as strange as it sounds, God says, the ravens are going to bring you food. Now, I don't know how much you have studied animals and birds and so forth, but most of their time, it seems, is spent hunting for and gathering and eating their food. They share it with their babies, but that's all. A raven doesn't get food and go take it over to a fox. But God says these ravens are going to bring you this food. God had promised to provide. Do you understand? He's promised to provide everything we need. Whatever your situation is today, you can rely upon that promise. That's not my promise. That's God's promise. He provides for every bird. He provides for every insect. He provides for every animal. He provides for every fish. Certainly he'll provide for his children. In fact, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap. Nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So God, the God that feeds the birds, had told Elijah that these birds would bring him bread and flesh in the morning and in the evening. We see Elijah's obedience then in verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Not only did Elijah obey God, but the ravens obeyed God. Verse 6 says, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Now for a moment, put yourself, if you will, in the place of Elijah. We don't know exactly what his life had been before this, but right now he's isolated. Right now he's alone. Right now he's being protected by God, He's in God's protective program, but he's hiding out from the king. And he's being fed by the ravens. Kind of an unusual situation. However, he's obeying the Lord, so he's under this special protection, receiving special provision from the Lord. And even though the accommodations aren't the best, perhaps, at least he knows he's in the center of God's will. Let me remind you something, that's, that's a great place to be, in the center of God's will. As we're going through this message, look into your own heart and ask yourself, am I in the center of God's will? If you know that you've stepped aside, or if you know there's something in your life that ought not to be there, or something that ought to be there, right now is the time to get into the center of God's will. But this is not the end of the story. It's still not raining. The land is becoming parched. The crops are failing. And we learn later on that the king 
will be searching everywhere during this time trying to find Elijah. Look then in verse 7. This really is the text. This is the main part of the message. In verse 7, we see the problem. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Even though the entire nation had been affected by this drought, Elijah had been fine. God had placed him in this one little place where the brook was still flowing and the water was still coming. And then the brook dried up. We know he's in the center of God's will, but the brook dries up. We know we can't live without water. Doesn't matter how good our meals are. If we don't have water, we'll die. Elijah needed water. How do we deal with the situation like this? When we, when we know we're in God's will, we know we're doing what he wants us to do, we're following him to the best of our ability, and then the brook dries up. And then big problems come anyway. Not one of us could have predicted all the problems that America has faced in these past three months. The economy was thriving. Nearly everyone who wanted to work was working. People had jobs. Things were going great. And then came this virus. It was like a punch in the gut. Now, our government is trying to help us. And I understand, that, of course, they're using our tax money. But they're trying to help us and get us through this. And I understand that. But this involves people who are evil and dishonest as well as Christians who are honest and honorable, faithful serving him. God allowed the problem into the life of Elijah when he was in his perfect will and he often allows problems into our lives even when we're in his will. So I want you to see the rest of the story. Before I do, let's just think of a few of the promises of God. Just give you several promises. Philippians 4.19, we're, we're reminded that God has promised to provide all our needs. The Bible says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This promise is written, if you read Philippians chapter 4, written to those who are faithful serving God. We read in Matthew chapter 6, as you read earlier, that God takes care of the tiny bird, so certainly he'll take care of his children. Another promise is found in Hebrews chapter 13. God has promised never to leave us. Here's how verse 5 reads, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. No matter how dark the night is or how deep the valley is, God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. There's another wonderful promise in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 where God promises to give us grace and strength when we're going through problems. For 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now listen carefully. He most often doesn't give us the strength until we need it. The writer here in 2 Corinthians had faced more problems than most of us will ever face. And yet he says that God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Another promise is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What a blessing this is. God has promised to limit our problems. He knows how much we can handle. And here's what he says as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you or not allow you, not permit you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we can handle. And He knows exactly when to send that relief. But get this, He still allows the problems. So what are we supposed to do when they come? What are we supposed to do while we're waiting for his protection and we're waiting for his provision? Look back to our text and I'll show you what Elijah did. Gives us a picture of what we're supposed to do. We see the plan of God. We're continuing now in 1 Kings 17, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, to Elijah, saying, 
Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, how about this? God is about to provide home-cooked dinners for Elijah. Now, just when the source of water dries up, he's about to provide water and meals for Elijah. God told him to go to Zarephath. There'd be a widow woman there who would prepare the meals. God had a plan for Elijah to take care of him. Several lessons. Listen to these. This is what I want you to get. So please, listen to these. Get these lessons. Grab onto these lessons because these are what God has for us today. Number one, God hadn't forgotten him. Even though, he was, even though we'll learn later on in this passage of Scripture that the, the king and some of his men had been searching all over for him, God had protected him. God had hidden him, but God hadn't forgotten him. His place was such that I think only the birds could find it, and they brought him the food. Sometimes we think in our lives that our situation is so small, our situation, our place is so insignificant that maybe God has forgotten us. Let me assure you, he hasn't forgotten you. What a blessing that is. Second thought is this. God had already made plans for Elijah's future. Over in Zarephath, unbeknownst to Elijah, there was a widow woman who needed some help. She had no family. Apparently, her husband, she had a son, but her husband was gone. Uh, perhaps uh, he's, uh, he had been gone for a long time. Uh, she had died. Maybe uh, she was a cook and her restaurant had had to be closed because of the drought. We don't know all those details. Uh, maybe she's just a good cook and, and God said, Elijah, you've been faithful to me. I'm going to get you some good home cooking. Whatever it was, we don't see any way that Elijah knew this woman or she knew him, but God knew both of them. I talked to a businessman this week, one of the men in our church, who told me how when this uh, crisis came, uh, he was a bit apprehensive and he thought that it would really badly affect his business. And then he showed, he shared with me how that God had turned some things around and, and made some things available so that instead of uh, the, this hurting his business, it had actually helped his business. We discussed the way God takes care of us and how God knows our needs and has things set up for us before we even know about it. I believe God expects us to obey him and walk by faith because he knows what we need and he already has plans for us. Let me remind you of something else. Kind of a little parenthesis here. God's not in a hurry. We often think God's, he's too slow. Why do, he doesn't give us the strength we need until we need it. He doesn't give us often what we need until we exercise the faith to believe him for it. Often he's trying to build us up and strengthen our faith. Oswald Chambers wrote this. God is never in a hurry. If we wait... We shall see that God is pointing out that we have not been interested in himself. We've been interested in his blessings. Our faith is to be in him. He already has made plans for our future. Let me give you another thought, and that's this. God often works through strange circumstances. We can see that in this story quite clearly. Elijah was sent into God's protective program while hiding in this remote area by this little brook. Birds come and feed him. How strange. But as we study the Bible, we see many times when God used strange circumstances to accomplish his will. I remember a time as we read the Bible when a young teenage boy took a sling and, a, and stones and with the sling and stones defeated a giant that the entire army was afraid of. Strange circumstances. I remember a time when God used a huge fish to swallow up one of his prophets that was rebellious in order to get him to do his will. I remember a time when God used a talking donkey to get the attention of one of his prophets. I remember a time when God used a virgin young woman who was a virgin 
to bear a son who would be the son of God. I remember a time when Jesus then took a boy's lunch and with that small lunch, some fish and some bread fed thousands of strange circumstances. I remember a time when Jesus Christ allowed himself to die. And he allowed himself to die so that he could offer us eternal life. Strange circumstances. Here's a suggestion today. Evaluate your situation. Is God using the circumstances where you find yourself today, is he using those to teach you a lesson? Is he using those to strengthen your faith? Or are you fretting and worried? Learn. Get the lesson God has for you. God often works through strange circumstances. <laughs> Here's another lesson. God's plan is better than our plan. Consider this in the life of Elijah. He's over here eating uh, bread and flesh brought by the ravens. And God's plan then, after the brook dries up, is that he gets home-cooked meals. He's over here drinking out of this, the brook, probably lapping it up with his hands, and his, uh, cupping it in his hands. And, and now he's going to be over with this widow woman and probably drinking out of her finest vessel. Instead of leftover bread, he gets hot, baked bread out of the oven. <laughs> home-cooked meals. Instead of eating alone, now he's eating with this widow, widow and her son. Over and over and over, I see this happening in the lives of you, our people, and, and in my own life. I'll give you a quick illustration. Most of you know that I was a, an associate pastor for years in another ministry. I enjoyed that uh, position. I enjoyed that ministry, and I enjoyed that life. I thought that was for the rest of my life. And then one day, the brook dried up. Where I was, circumstances changed dramatically. I could no longer stay there, and God was moving me through those circumstances to become a senior pastor. And I've now been here over 20 years and love it. God's plan is better than my plan. I imagine Elijah probably had settled in. He'd said, okay, this isn't the best of accommodation, but this is what I have. And, and maybe got comfortable there with the ravens feeding him and drinking out of the brook, but God had a better plan. To prepare Elijah for that better plan, he had to allow the brook to dry up and bring that problem into his life. Then one more important thought, and I'll be done, and that's this. We need to exercise faith. Now, faith is trusting God when we don't understand. If I understand, that's not faith. I can do those things. Faith is trusting when we don't understand. Can you imagine the uh, discouragement that must have come to Elijah and perhaps even the depression as he's uh, being taken care of and all of a uh, sudden he realizes the brook is dried up. There's no water. Why did this happen? What was going to happen to him? Why did God, while he's obeying him, allow this problem. It's because God had a better plan and he wanted Elijah to trust him by faith. Look in verse 10 and we see his response. God has said, uh, the brook's dried up, okay. You go over here, I've got somebody ready to take care of you. Look what happens in verse 10. So he, Elijah, arose and went to Zarephath. He said, this is what God says to do. This is what I'll do. God says to go, I'll go. God says to stay, I'll stay. He arose and went. That's called faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it's impossible to please him. Let me mention two ways we exercise faith. First of all, we need saving faith. The Bible says we're saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 8 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. In order to be saved, a person must trust in Jesus Christ. Not ourselves, not our works, not our baptism. Trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. Realize that we're sinners and we deserve the punishment that he took. Trust him for salvation. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
Being saved means our sins have been forgiven. Being saved means that we are right with God. Being saved means that he's preparing us a home in heaven for eternity. If you're listening to this message today and you've never been saved, you need to exercise that faith. You say, I'm not sure it'll happen. Faith. Faith is believing what you can't understand. He promises it. He will deliver on his promises. We need saving faith. And then we need submissive faith. Submissive faith is when we say, whatever God says, I'll do. Whatever you want, I'll do. If you want me over here by a brook hiding out, that's where I'll go. If you want me over here helping this widow woman and eating these home-cooked meals, that's where I'll go. Trust him, submit to him by faith. Are, are you willing to follow his will for your life? Just this week, I heard about another one of the men in our church who, unlike the other businessman whose business had prospered, uh, this man lost his job. He has a family to support. He lost his job, and he was uh, working some part-time things and so forth, but he did not have a job. Now, let's help you understand something. While people are losing their jobs all around us and while the unemployment rate is rising, is not a good time to be looking for a job. But this man and his wife prayed and asked God for a job, and I believe he starts this next week. He got a new job. He got a better job because he exercised faith in his God. Can you see that God knows what we need? God knows what we are, where we are. He has not forgotten us. No matter how small or insignificant you think you are or your job is or your place is, God hasn't forgotten. God wants to protect us and provide us. Will you trust him? The song we sing sometimes says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Would you do that today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. I pray, Father, for those who have listened to this message. If they are not saved, they would trust Jesus Christ. Ask him to be their savior. Ask him to forgive their sinfulness. You've promised you'd do that. And for every Christian who has listened, help us to have faith in you. Help us to trust you, whether we're going through big problems, little problems, or no problem. Help us to trust you. Thank you that we can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.